In this video, we are going to introduce some early ideas from atomic theory. And in doing this, we're actually going to go all the way back to early Greek philosophers and essentially build up our understanding of the atom, you know, up until the early 1900s. And we're going to do this in, in the context of a, a little case activity. So throughout this video, I'm going to be routinely asking you to, you know, pause and think about the concepts for a second uh, before moving on. And so this video is basically a recording of a little case activity uh, that I would normally be given in the classroom. Okay, so the, the ideas that we want to cover here, we're looking at the history of, uh, you know, our basic understanding of atomic structure. So we're going to first talk about basically where this idea came from. Where did the idea of atoms originate? And we're going to explore the evidence that allows us to conclude and support this idea that atoms exist. And finally, we're going to look at how our models of the atom have evolved over time. And this is, you know, argu arguably one of the most important aspects of this discussion here, because we're going to see, you know, a, a kind of a front row seat to the evolution and development of scientific ideas. Okay, so we're really going to be doing a tour uh, through scientific history. Okay, and so our first starting point here on our little tour is going to be talking about, you know, as I said, going all the way back to early Greek philosophers. And we're going to look at the, uh, some of the writings and ideas of Democritus. Okay, so either, uh, you know, pause the screen here, um, you know, go ahead and read through this paragraph. Or you can bring up the associated lecture slides here, and if that's a little bit easier to see, and go ahead and read those. So this is a little excerpt, um, you know, from Aristotle that talks about Democritus's ideas regarding this concept of atomism. So I want you to take read this, and once you are finished reading this little section, I want you to start talking, thinking about the following set of questions. Okay, so the following slide has five different choices here that <clears throat> are at where I'm asking you to choose which one of these uh, it really describes the evidence that Democritus put forward in the preceding reading. Okay, So while you're reading, right, we want to see all right, what is Democritus is the core of his argument. Is it A, you know, since matter is not empty space, it must be made of uncuttable particles. B, the Greeks observed that chemical reactions could take place. Chemical reactions cannot take place unless matter is made up of uncuttable particles, atoms. If you divide up matter into smaller pieces forever and ever for infinity, you end up with essentially nothing. Since matter cannot be made up of nothing, it must have small fundamental units of matter that are uncuttable. Right? We'll call these atoms. Okay? Or is it A and B or C and E? Okay. So I'm um, go ahead and pause the video now, do that reading, think about those questions and come up with your response. Okay, so hopefully you've had time to run through that and, and digest it. And so you can test yourself now, which one of these did you uh, come up with? Well, A, all right, since matter is not empty space, it must be made up of uncuttable particles, right? Does, you know, the, do these two statements follow from one another? Well, not necessarily, and that's not really what Democritus was using in his argument. And of course, B, right, B is, you know, supposing the existence of these chemical reactions, you know, a really thorough discussion of chemical reactions, um, you know, didn't come until much, much later. And so, of course, C, we're drawn to C as the correct answer here. And if we zoom in on the excerpts of this reading assignment, highlighted in red here, right, we can see the really core of Democritus' argument. So right up here, right? So if you were able to just completely continue, continue forever and ever dividing up matter, right? You, uh, you know, Democritus, Democritus raises the question of, well, you know, you keep doing this forever and ever, well, you know, what's going to be left, right? Well, you can't have something left because if something was left, then you could continue dividing it, okay? And <clears throat> as a result, 
he basically says that in, in order for matter to be made of something, this process of infinite division must come to a close at some time. So there must be some sort of uh, indivisible unit of matter. And the name, of course, was given uh, you know, from this concept of atomism, the atom. So the atom is viewed as this indivisible unit of matter. And these ideas you know, date way, way back to some of our, er our early thinkers. Okay, but there's an important thing to notice here. Right. So when looking at the work of these um, you know, early philosophers, uh, you know, one thing that we typically associate with science is decisively lacking, right? namely experimentation. There are no experiments here. This was you know, a, a thought experiment, if you will, um, that basically led Democritus to this idea of the atom. Right? So our next stop on our little tour of the history of the atom here is really going to take place um, with the work of Dalton, who was you know, one of the first uh, you know, scientists, as we think of them today, that put together experiments that allowed us to really tease out um, all the sort of the, the experimental evidence and really build up that experimental evidence to tease out the existence of atoms. All right, so Dalton's atomic theory, uh, early 1800s here, told us a number of very important things. Three, right? Three very important things. The first is that matter is comprised of indivisible particles called atoms, okay? So take that term atom, and, and so this is really experimental evidence for the existence of these atoms, right? Second, Dalton showed us that atoms of the same element have the same chemical properties, okay? So not only are these, these basic chemical building blocks called atoms, right? But atoms of the same type, right, uh, have the same properties. Okay, so there's only a few different types of little blocks that we can build up all of matter from. And finally, found that compounds are made of combinations of atoms of different elements, and they're formed in reactions where the rearrangements or separations of atoms occur, but you can never create or destroy atoms in these chemical reactions. So you're basically shuffling atoms around, okay? And so these three points here are really cornerstones of modern chemistry and something that we're, uh, you know, really taking for granted in this class and something that, you know, you know doubt covered in your introductory chemistry courses, okay? And so what we're going to do then is, you know, take a few minutes to analyze the type of data that Dalton was looking at that led him to draw these conclusions. Okay, so what I've got here on this next slide is an example of the you know, you know, types of data that Dalton would uh, collect. Okay? And so the, this first set of data essentially com is comprised of oxygen chromium containing compounds. Okay? So all of these com both of these compounds here, there's two different types of compounds. They all, all, both of them contain just oxygen right? and chromium but they're different compounds. They're different types of compounds. And you can see this by their appearance. Why, sample number one looks like orange crystals, whereas sample number two looks like red powder. So very clear uh, distinction between the two of them. So we know they're different compounds, but of course, at the end of the day, they're both comprised of the same types of elements. Okay, so the interesting part then is what you know, Dalton ended up doing was basically looking at the uh, you know breakdown uh, results of breaking each one of these two different samples down into their respective uh, elements, okay? Which of course is chromium and oxygen. So if you break down sample one, the orange crystals, he found that you get 1.35 grams uh, in this given sample of chromium and 0 0.93 grams of oxygen. Okay. If you do a similar sort of decomposition on the red powder, yeah, for this given sample, he found that there's 0 0.64 grams of chromium and 0 0.14 grams of oxygen. Okay, now for this third line item here, we've got another sample of red powder, okay? But in this sample of red powder, we have a different mass of chromium, okay? And so the types of things that Dalton would then, uh, you know, try and predict and then subsequently verify by experiment 
is, you know, given, can we predict what the mass of the other compound, oxygen in this case, will be given the fact that we know we have 1.35 grams of chromium and given the fact that we know we have the same red powder and so we can use this data up here from the second row. Okay, so we want to use both the second row of data, these guys right here, okay, and we want to use this mass of chromium to come up with a prediction of what's going to be here, what's going to be the mass of oxygen in this second sample of sample number two. So I'd like you to think about this for a minute. I want you to think about this. Okay, we've got this idea of atoms. How can we use this idea of atoms to basically predict this unknown quantity here? So go ahead and pause the video for a second and, and see what you can come up with. Okay, so hopefully, right, what you noticed is that, you know, when you're looking at the ratio, right, between chromium and oxygen, right, this ratio must remain fixed, assuming you are looking at a given chemical compound. So this chemical compound, we're calling it sample two, it looks like a red powder, must always have the same ratio of chromium and oxygen, okay? So if we set up that ratio and we say, let's look at grams of chromium up top, right? So we'll put grams of chromium up top over grams of oxygen, this ratio must always be constant, okay? So if we take our unknown, well, we're gonna plug in this value of 1.35, we'll put it in right up top here. We don't know the grams of oxygen before we solve the problem, but we know that that ratio must be equal to the ratio built up from our first sample where we have both grams of chromium and grams of oxygen. So we can solve for X, okay? We can solve for X here and we arrive at a mass of oxygen of 0 0.31. Okay, so that's interesting in its own right. And Dalton did this for many, many different types of samples and got these same sorts of results. So he was able to say, hey, I know what kind of compound this is, right? It's a red powder, it's this chromium oxide that's a red powder. So you're always able to sort of fill in blanks on tables like this. All right, now for the next question, okay? Let's say um, that we know that sample number two here has exactly the ratio of one chromium atom for every one oxygen atom. And we're gonna denote that, you know, right like this by just writing chromium and oxygen, no subscripts on there, we're just writing one one-to-one uh, -one ratio, okay? We wanna use that knowledge that sample two is a one-to-one -one ratio of chromium and oxygen to determine the chemical formula for sample number one, okay? So we're using the same data table up here. We've now even filled in the data table, okay? And we wanna, again, use the fact that sample number two here, right? Sample number two is CRO, to, and we wanna use that to figure out what that chemical formula is for sample number one. So once again, I'd like you to pause the video um, and, and see if you can work through this problem um, before moving on. Okay, so what we're gonna rely on here is the data presented uh, on the first and third lines. Why? Well, okay, we've got this mass of chromium that is actually constant between the two samples, okay? So we know it's that there's the same amount of chromium that's present, okay? So now what we do is we take the corresponding masses of oxygen and look at their relative relationship. We know that this uh, sample number two has uh, only one oxygen per chromium, okay? And if we look at the ratio of, uh, you know, sample number one, 
over sample number two in this case, 0 0.93 over 0 0.31, we carry out that division, we find a ratio of approximately three. Now remember, this is actual experimental data, so nothing's gonna be you know, exact here, right? So we're, we're something that's, a, we get a value that's something of close to three, okay? So we see that in this sample of chromium, ox, uh, and oxygen, right? The ratio, okay, the ratio of chromium to oxygen down here is one to one. This is a one to one ratio. But for the same amount of chromium, we find that the mass of oxygen in sample number one is roughly three times greater, okay? So there's roughly three times as much oxygen, which means that the chemical formula must be chromium with three oxygens on it. Okay, and so this was the final, uh, you know, sort of evidence that, you know, Dalton would put together. And again, he did this for many, many different types of compounds. And he'd always find that uh, these atoms are showing up in roughly whole number ratios. Okay, so let's make note of that here. So we've got roughly whole number ratios are always showing up, okay. Okay, so using these sorts of experiments as your guide, let's take a look at the following problem. Okay, so I want you guys to determine what evidence Dalton used to conclude that atoms exist. Okay, so first up, is it that, you know, since chromium monoxide um, has two different types of compounds, this sample one and sample two, it must be made up of chromium and oxygen atoms. B, since the mass of chromium was the same in each sample, that indicates that chromium must be made up of identical atoms. Or C, since the two chromium oxide samples had different masses of oxygen, and oxygen masses differed in whole number ratios, that suggests the compounds had different numbers of oxygen units, or atoms. If the atoms could be cut up into some different sizes, then the whole number ratios would simply not exist, right? Or is it A and B, or are all of the above A, B, and C correct? Please pause the video for a few uh, seconds here, maybe a minute or two, and think about which one of these is the correct solution. Okay, so hopefully going back and looking at um, you know, text, you know, the problems like this, where we're seeing this whole number ratio, right? And again, I said that he found these whole number ratios over and over and over again, right? This is in fact the evidence that allowed Dalton to conclude um, atoms exist. So strong, you know, really the first strong empirical evidence, experimental evidence for the existence of these atoms, these whole number ratios showing up time and time again. Okay, all right, so that was Dalton. Okay, so the, Dalton gives us this idea and experimental evidence to back it up that atoms exist, there's all these different types of atoms, and changes occur, but we're never actually destroying or creating new atoms, we're basically just shuffling them around. And so with that uh, experimental evidence sort of nailed down, we're ready to start uh, moving to you know, much more recent experiments that relied on more advanced instrumentation, they basically started to explore this concept like, okay, we've got these atoms, right? But the next logical question to ask is, well, is that the final story? Are there these just little atoms? What makes one atom different from another? There's gotta be something um, you know, inside that atom that differentiates one from the other, okay? So the remainder experiments we're gonna talk about in this little mini lecture here is basically gonna go through and look at the ex mounting experimental evidence that we use to explore the different facets of atomic structure, okay? So, as many of you guys know, it turns out that atoms are not indivisible, right? They, they do have a substructure. And one of the first scientists to uh, talk about that substructure was a gentleman by the name of J.J. Thompson, okay? And Thompson came up with a really uh, clever pan plan for, you know, understanding atomic structure, and he ended up using a device called a cathode ray tube, okay? So it's basically this evacuated chamber here. I'll kind of outline it for you, okay? So we've got this evacuated chamber, 
and he's got a, a, a heat source that basically creates, a, it, it breaks apart parts of the atom and creates this little ray of particles. So I don't know if you can see it, right? but there's this little ray of particles kind of going down the center here and then a little detector screen, um, you know, where they're, they're impacting. And so you, uh, those of you that are, um, you, know, you know, my age perhaps, uh, might remember uh, cathode ray tubes as, you know, the key component, technological component of old-fashioned TV screens. So if you had a, a, you know, big TV that you could barely lift off the table, um, you know, that's, uh, or even old monitors, computer monitors, relied on this sort of technology. Okay, obviously we, we've moved on from that, but cathode rays has had a lot of very important, you know, uh, impact, you know, outside of research. Okay, so J.J. Thompson used this concept and did a, a really cool experiment where basically he found that when you heat up these atoms, heat up this sample, what ends up happening is you get these little particles emitted. And those are the things I traced the, uh, traced the, the path on the previous um, you know, slide. And what he found is that the path of particles that are coming out of that sample here, okay, can be subject to bending, right? By putting in, uh, you know, basically a magnetic field or electric field. He did both, right? Um, and really what I want you guys to, to focus in on is that, well, hey, I've got a charged particle here. If I were to put up a, you know, a potential difference, for example, here, a potential difference and basically say, hey, you know, make it, uh, you know, there, make it such that if you have a charged particle, right, flowing in this little beam here, then that charged particle is going to be attracted to one side of the cathode. In that case, it'll be this side up here, right, and be repelled by the other side. Okay, and again, you you can play games with you know magnetic fields, you know electric fields. You can do a lot of stuff here with that. Okay, um, but then the point is that if these particles are neutral, then there would be no deflection. So I'll put in a line here in blue, right? So this is what we would expect if we had a neutral particle. Okay, so here's what happened, okay, and the, the, the evidence is right here in front of us. In green, okay, he found that you can break apart these atoms and you can pull out some sort of component, right, that gets deflected according to these green lines here. Gets deflected, and, and because it's deflecting this way, we conclude that this little line of particles, the little green line here, right, is a negatively charged particle that's coming out of that sample, okay? And we call these particles electrons. So we have this little electron beam. Get that spelled there, electron beam um, that is uh, uh, you know, basically being deflected here, and we're then concluding that this matter that was, you know, was sitting there, a sample of matter, electrically neutral matter, can be broken down and you can pull out negatively charged particles. Okay, so now what I want you to do is use this fact that we can start off with neutral matter, neutral matter here, heat it up, break it apart, pull out negatively charged particles to build up an initial model of the atom based only on J.J. Thompson's cathode ray tube, okay? So to help you along here, I'm gonna give you four choices, okay? So the first choice, right, is a basic atomic model where I've got an atom and I've got some negatively charged particles on the inside, okay? So here's my atom here. So this is just my, my little atom. And then I've got these negatively charged particles floating around on the inside there, okay? And notice, I'm not saying anything about the structure of these things. They're just sort of randomly in there, okay? B, right, uh, is it an atomic model with randomly distributed negative charges and some undefined distribution of positive charges, right? Does J.J. Thompson's model, you know, support something like this? Or, 
does Thompson's work suggest that an atomic model with an equal number of positive and negative charges exists, where negative charges are on the periphery out here, and all the positive charges are localized in the center? Okay. And the, or D, an atomic model with an orderly distribution of negative charges. So not only are they on the periphery, but they're in some sort of you know, shell arrangement here. Okay. All right, now I want you to be careful here. Right? I want you to only use the results from J.J. Thompson's experiment. I know many of us, if you're taking university chemistry, right, you've taken a chemistry class either in high school or you know introductory chemistry class, so you might know more. But you know the, what I want to tease out with this uh, question here is I want you to go back and just look at these experimental results on the cathode ray tube using only this experimental evidence, which one of these models is supported. Go ahead and pause the video for a few seconds and give that some thought. Okay, let's go ahead and think through each one of these. So A, so of course the presence of this cathode ray, this presence of this beam of electrons, negatively charged particles, uh, is sort of flying through the air here. Right, this beam of electrons obviously tells us that there are negative charges present. Okay, so having these negative charges present um, is is certainly confirmed by J. J. Thompson's experiment. Okay, but if we couple that with the fact that we're started off with an electrically neutral matter, well, if you pull negative charges out and you started off with electrically neutral matter that means that there must be some positively charged particles present. So J.J. Thompson allows us to go further than A here. Okay, we can go a step further. And so in B, JJ, this model says, okay, not only do we have the negatively charged particles, but J.J. Thompson's experiments also confirm the presence of positive charge. Okay. Now, we don't know anything about the, the distribution from Thompson's experiment, right? We just know that there must be some sort of undefined distribution of positive charge present in order to balance out that negative charge, okay? And so if we go on to B, C, and D, all three have the presence of positive negative charges, okay? But notice, both C and D assume a structure of the positive charge, and D goes as far as to assume a structure of the negative charge. So you have to ask yourself, did Thompson's experiment come up with any sort of refinement or information regarding the structure of that positive charge? And the answer is no, right? All he says is that, hey, there must be some positive charge, but we don't know that it's all localized there in the middle, right? So you might know that from additional experiments, which we'll talk about shortly, but just based on Thompson's experiments alone, you can't draw that conclusion. And of course, you know, the presence of this little beam of negatively charged particles doesn't say anything about how those negative particles are formed. So the shell structure is thrown out as well. So as a result, our correct answer is going to be B, right? It, we know there's positive and negative in there. We know there's negative particles but who knows what that positive charge distribution looks like. Okay, and so this is one of my, my you know, very, the, one of the very important sort of scientific, you know, philosophical points here. When you are learning to interpret scientific data, it's very important to go back to just that data at hand and then build a model based on what you know, okay? Don't draw on other stuff, especially the stuff that's not empirically verified. Okay, but then as science, uh, you, you know, evolves, grows, right, then other experimental data can be brought in and the model can be tuned and refined. Okay, and so that's what we're going to do here. So J.J. Thompson gets us to this model here presented in B. The next set of experiments we're going to look at were performed by a gentleman by the name of Rutherford. Okay, and you might have heard of uh, Ernest Rutherford's gold foil experiments. In a previous class, we're going to take a closer look at the work that uh, Rutherford did here. So Rutherford used a uh, you know a, a pretty complex experimental setup, right? Relatively complex, certainly for the time, where he took a alpha particle emitter, 
right? And so an alpha particle, remember, is basically shooting out, um, you know, for those of you that have taken chemistry before, it's, you know, you know basically a helium 2 plus or a nucleus, a helium nucleus, okay? Um, the point is it's a positively charged particle. So I want you to think positively charged particle being shot out. Okay, and you'll actually learn more about these uh, later on in your chemistry studies when you talk about uh, nuclear chemistry in you know, the second semester of uh, general chemistry here. All right, but for right now, I want you to just say that, okay, alpha particle is just positively charged particle that's uh, you know, being shot out of this box. Okay, so we have positive charges um, kind of coming out here. Okay, and then what he did is he took um, a piece of gold foil and he hammered it down, made it extremely thin, okay, extremely thin uh, piece of gold foil. And then he shot those alpha particles directly at that thin piece of gold foil. Okay, so the interesting point, what he found um, and that's you know, you know, most remarkable um, you know, right off the bat is that even though you're shooting these particles at a, a piece of gold foil, he found that over 99.99% of those alpha particles actually pass straight through as if that gold foil wasn't even present. Okay? And that 0.001% that do uh, get deflected, right? they get deflected in all sorts of different directions. Some of them just going to get deflected a little bit. Others get de deflected you know, you know, quite a bit more. Others will practically bounce straight back and hit almost right next to that uh, alpha particle emitter, okay? And so this was, you know, some pretty surprising results that allowed us to draw a number of conclusions about atomic structure, okay? So I want you to use these results here to predict, um, you know, which one of our four models um, is now going to be the model of choice, now based on both Rutherford's and Thompson's evidence. So go ahead and pause the video. Think about the experimental results that I just gave you. Pause the video and come up with your best selection here. Okay, so hopefully you see that now we're, we're basically taking things a step further. We know there's negative charge, okay? But the fact that the vast majority of those positive charged particles passed right through, right, without being deflected, indicates that those positive charges that are present in that in those gold atoms must somehow be localized to only certain regions of space okay so it was only when those positive charged particles would be very close to this region of positive charge that we would see any sort of deflection okay so it's only this guy in the middle here that's deflected Okay, and so it's actually this model C then that Rutherford's gold foil experiment really pointed towards. So he pointed to the existence of this localized region of a lot of positive charge that we, of course, now call the nucleus of the atom. Okay, so to see what I'm talking about here with a little bit prettier picture, uh, so basically if we had something like, you know, from B, okay, um, B in our, uh, in our examples up here, this undefined region of positive charge. If we had something like that, then there wouldn't be a localized region for this alpha particle to run into, get deflected by, bounce off of, or anything like that. What must be happening is that there is, uh, you know, according to the actual result, some region in space, right, where we have a bunch of really localized positive charges, right, giving rise to, um, you know, the, this behavior that Rutherford observed. Okay, so there, there's a very interesting progression here. We're going to, there's, there's many more experiments. We're going to talk about just one more, right, because at this point, um, we have, thanks to J.J. Thompson, the electron, and we have, thanks to Rutherford, this idea of this localized positive charge, right, and, you know, we, we led us to start thinking about this concept of a proton, Right. Um, the last experiment that I want to put out here is work done by a gentleman by the name of Chadwick Beryllium, um, who, interestingly enough, used a beryllium plate, um, not related, you know, the, the name there is not related, he used a beryllium plate and shot uh, alpha particles into this beryllium plate. Okay. 
and uh, actually found um, that there are these electrically neutral particles that would you know show up on the other side here so with these experiments all taken together we have the sort of nuclear model of the atom where you have a nuclear region that is protons positively charged protons negatively charged neutrons okay that are present in this dense region that comprises a very very small volume of the nucleus uh, of the atom and then uh, a corresponding electron cloud that surrounds the uh, you know atom here and this gave rise to the models of the atom that maybe maybe many of you guys have seen they're on t-shirts and the media everywhere um, we'll find later in chapter six that this is actually wrong in many ways we've got some things right in this model for example there's nuclear region electrons around the nucleus right but this orbital model and this idea that they're somehow just sort of circling around uh, turns out we need to do some more work on that but before we get to that more those more advanced concepts we're going to use um, you know this basic idea of atomic structure these three basic atoms to start answering some uh, and describing um, some very interesting chemistry uh, questions and topics okay so for example we know how the basic structure of of atoms you know it looks right this this kind of orbital model that many of us have carried around in our heads right but now what we want to start talking about is okay there's different types of atoms we know there's different types of atoms we saw in Dalton's experiments there's chromium and oxygen there's two of them you guys have no doubt heard of many others right so we want to now look at how these different elements uh, differ from one another what is it about their structure that uh, gives rise to this different identities right and we want to look about at how all these different elements are organized okay so we're going to start answering both of these questions in the next mini lecture